This is The Big Jump, a podcast about human reinvention, featuring pro athletes who have leveraged their athletic minds for success beyond sports. I'm your host, David Gardner, a professional basketball player turned CEO of branding firm Color Jar. Welcome to episode one of The Big Jump. I am excited to bring you Actually, I would say I'm leaping out of my skin to bring you episode one of The Big Jump. I have poured my heart and sweat into creating this podcast series for you with the mission of inspiring your next big jump. The themes of this podcast are human reinvention and identity, and as your host, I sit down with a professional athlete in each episode to uncover his or her athletic mind and dig into the successes they've created beyond sports. This episode features Chris Humphreys. This is a rare interview given by Chris and was a real joy for me because he's a close friend and was a high school basketball teammate of mine. Yet, even with all that history, I still learned things about him during our conversation. Chris doesn't give many interviews, especially of this depth and breadth, and we cover topics he doesn't normally touch. And I promise you that you've never heard Chris quite like this before. You did some homework. I I don't really talk about that, but... (laughs) You know, my belief is that human reinvention doesn't happen like a butterfly who leaves its caterpillar past in the dust. Instead, we're much more like trees, adding rings that support our newly reinvented layers. So in each episode, I make sure to hit the seminal moments of a guest past because those important layers shape who a guest is today and perhaps who they will become tomorrow. So for Chris, some of those identity-shaping factors discussed are the competitive household in which he grew up, how swimming was his first love, beating the likes of Michael Phelps along the way to becoming the top 10-year-old swimmer in the world. And one thing that may surprise you is that during his NBA career, he's built what I'll call a budding business empire. That includes Five Guys Burger restaurants, hundreds of apartment units, and uh, other real estate holdings, cryptocurrency training, on and on. All of this while being an active NBA player. You know, with a nose for those business deals, we also talk about how he came to get banned from buying Range Rovers. Yes, you heard that correctly. Banned from buying Range Rovers due to an arbitrage opportunity he spotted. A very entertaining story uh, that I'd never heard before and you're hearing here first. And because this is a show about identity, we also discuss how reality television came to influence his perceived persona by the pop culture world, which then bled into NBA fans voting him the most hated player in the NBA, surpassing that old version of LeBron James who had taken his talents to South Beach. Funny how things change. This isn't a podcast about drama or gossip, but we've all been labeled, we've all been put in a box, and I think there's something for all of us to learn from Chris's approach to creating his own identity from within. An identity that originates from an intrinsically motivated place, one that stays true to who you are and how you've become who you are, even during times of intense scrutiny and pressure. So, check what you think you might know about Chris at the door, because in this episode, you are getting the real Chris that I know, but most of the world does not. You can't let fear dominate your life. You kind of have to teach yourself along the way, and it's risky, and it's it's exciting, though, when you look back and you say, okay, I'm, I'm doing really well, and I learned along the way and asked the right questions and had the right support. If you're listening while driving or perhaps juggling fire, don't worry, because everything and everyone discussed is all for you on the website with comprehensive show notes. Just go to thebigjumpshow.com, and we've got you covered. Along those lines, I want this podcast to become its best, and I learn from sports that feedback is love and improves performance, so give me some feedback. I want to create better content for you, so tell me what you liked, tell me what could be better. The Big Jump is on Instagram and Twitter, both at Big Jump Show, and leave a quick review on Apple Podcasts because it helps get the word out about the mission to inspire someone's next big jump. And remember to subscribe if you like what you hear and might want more. There's a lot more in store for season one of The Big Jump and beyond. I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Grand Voyage, a luxury fashion brand and a personal favorite of mine that makes shoes and bags designed in L.A. and handcrafted in Italy. GQ says they're, quote, changing the fashion game. And I always say, if you're changing up your game, you better look the part. So use promo code THEBIGJUMP for $35 off the beautiful bags and shoes from Grand Voyage. By the way, my favorite item has got to be the blue burnished leather high tops, which are handcrafted in Tuscany, Italy. 
So go check them out. See what I mean. Yes, blue leather high tops. Go to thebigjumpshow.com slash shoes. And from there, as they say, the rest is up to you. Last but not least, before jumping in, a very quick shout out to our high school basketball coach, Ken Novak Jr., and our mentor, NBA player, Chris Carr. Both are mentioned in this episode, and neither Chris nor I would be in the position to even be having this conversation without the two of these great men. Thank you to all the coaches and mentors out there, but especially from me and Chris, thank you, Coach Ken Novak Jr. and Coach Chris Carr for changing our lives in more ways than you may ever know. So with that, I give you my conversation with Chris Humphreys. All right, Chris Humphreys, my longtime friend and uh, 13-year NBA player. High school teammate. High school teammate. That's right. It's uh, amazing to think that we've known each other for more than half of our lives at this point. The first question I have for you is, what's your earliest memory playing sports? That's an amazing question. It would have to be third grade playing like in-house basketball. I'm real hyped up. You know, I'd been kind of working on my skills for a while. And my first like organized sports memory would be thinking that I scored the game winner but I actually scored on the wrong hoop. Oh. And I run to the <laughs> bench and I'm like, "Coach, <laughs> did you see that?" And he's like, uh, that's the wrong basket. I was trying to figure out why no one was hyped up and he's like, "Nah, you got the rebound and scored on the wrong hoop." Oh. Sorry, buddy. Heartbreaking. Yeah. Wrong way. So sports were sound like they were part of your household and really part of your upbringing from an early age. Then you have memories already in third grade playing. Yeah. You know, my family was a very athletic family. When you look at my sister, uh, had a full ride to swim at the University of Texas. My dad played football at the University of Minnesota. And my mom was actually on the rowing team at the University of Minnesota when it was a club sport. Now it's a scholarship sport, but back then it was a club sport. So growing up, I was always in kind of an active family. So our weekends were going to do stuff that was active. So we've kind of always had that foundation of competitiveness and, you know, being active from a young age. It's a really rare thing to have two parents as college athletes. And you mentioned competitiveness. What were some of the things that you think you got from your parents that were instilled in you at a young age? Well, yeah, you know, the way I was brought up, I think it really worked for me. But, you know, looking at some of the kids today, you know, you don't know if the same tactics would work. Like for me, when I was a kid, it was like, hey, if you do this, we'll go to Dairy Queen or if you get this record, we'll do this, or I'll pay you this or whatever. You know, it was always like incentive based. And my dad was one of those dads who was very, you know, he would push you, but you had to want it. You know, I think every kid goes through phases where they're like playing a sport and then they like, ah, I don't really like it. I want to quit or whatever. You know, when you're trying stuff out and my parents rule was if you start playing you have to finish the season. There's no quitting in this family. Wow. So it didn't matter. Like you went out for, I'm trying to think something I didn't even, I played tennis for a year and doing that. And I was like, oh man, it's not really my thing. My mom's like, nope, you got to finish it. It kind of taught me not to abandon things and, you know, try to always work through, you know, difficult things in sports because like in sports, it's never that easy. You always go through ups and downs, even great teams or great individuals throughout their careers. I love the uh, incentive-based yeah, training they yeah, gave you earlier. Do you remember an example of a specific kind of carrot, carrot they dangled? I do, actually. When I was, I was probably in fourth grade playing basketball, my dad goes, he said, if you score 20 points in this game, and like, keep in mind, when you're in like third, fourth grade, fourth grade, I think it was 20 points for an individual is a lot of points in a game, right? Cause the yeah. score of the game is usually like 40 or 30 something to whatever. And I had 20 by halftime and had 38 out of our team's 40 points. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if that was a good thing or not, but I was, it, it kind of got me in the mindset of, okay, let me, let me, get after this. Let me try to dominate. And that was just for like a, a Dairy Queen blizzard. You know? <laughs> I re vividly remember it. Well, now I know when I didn't get the extra pass from you <laughs> where that training came from. And it's funny because I actually, that was my mentality my whole life. 
Then I got in the NBA, drafted high and whatnot, and kind of still thought I had that mentality of just, you know, dictating the game and stuff. And I had to kind of adjust my mindset, my game to, you know, fit in and play a long time. Cause you know, not, not everyone comes in the NBA and it's LeBron James or someone of that caliber where it's like, okay, you're the future, whatever, whatever the case is. And obviously he's more talented than I ever was, but you know, it's just, it's just interesting to, to kind of see how things change from when I was younger to older and how I had to adapt. You know, being in a very athletic household, you talked a lot about basketball there, but your first love was swimming. Yes, yes. How did you come to start swimming? Well, my sister got into swimming earlier. She ended up, like I said earlier, swimming at the University of Texas. And it was just something that I did from a young age. Like my parents were big believers in everyone knowing how to swim and taking swimming lessons and being a very good swimmer because my grandpa had a cabin and we were on the lake growing up and stuff like that. So swimming was something they wanted me to be good at. And I just kind of was a, a natural at it and swam really at a high level till I was about, you know, 11, 12 years old. Right. So there's a huge delta between knowing how to swim at your grandpa's cabin in Minnesota and setting national records, which you did as a youth. At what point did it become serious for you? You said you had talent at it. How did it go from let's make sure Chris knows how to swim to something that you began to dedicate yourself to? I think it was just the commitment on my part and my parents. You know, swimming is, I always say that swimming is probably the hardest sport to train for physically. You're doing two a days, two and a half, three hours in the pool twice a day. And it's just a huge commitment. It's cold outside. The pool's not warm. You know, just it, it's physically really difficult to do, although it's it doesn't bang up your body the way like playing football would uh, per se, but it's very physically challenging. Like I said, if you can train for swimming, you can pretty much stick it out in anything, whatever sport it is, because you're in just the greatest shape. A lot of times it's just you in your own mind in the pool. You're in there. I mean, you have some breaks between sets and stuff, but you're you're really just alone with yourself most of the time when you're training and swimming. So you're the same age as Michael Phelps. So you grew up swimming and competing against Michael Phelps. So yeah, everyone always says, so you beat Michael Phelps, this and that, which I did at a real young age, but he wasn't as good as he, he kind of blossomed, started to blossom at the time that I was kind of no longer really into it. And I discovered basketball and all that. You know, my biggest competition was this guy named, I think it was Justin Smith. You know, I was the best probably when I was nine, 10. And I went to a meet and he won some events. And I'm, I'm used to going to like a meet and winning almost like every single event, right? And he won some events. And then the whole next few months before I was going to like swim against him again, you know, I'd be doing push ups, sit ups at home. My dad would be like, this one's for Justin. This one's for Justin. So he was just like, the total motivator and it was working. So your dad would paint an image of Justin sort of as the arch nemesis and like, imagine what Justin's doing right now. Exactly. You need to do one more push up or. Exactly. And then the next time I saw him, I, I, you know, dominated. So this is 10 and under nationals and you placed in the top 10 and nine of 10 events. And you had the record for 50 meter freestyle and 100 meter freestyle that stood for 18 years. So you're being, a, you're a modest guy. Wow, you guy. did some homework. I, I don't really talk about that. But. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be prepared. I learned that from well, sports too. Yeah, so, yeah. but you know, you're, you're a humble guy. You're a, a modest Minnesota, nice Midwestern guy. And so I appreciate you talking about this, but I think it's important for, you know, to realize the level of success that you saw records don't hold for 18 years often. So you were really setting the bar. Right. You know, at one time, I think I had four or five national records, which I found out later were also world records at the time. So not to be that guy, but at one point, probably at, at about 10 years old, I was probably the best swimmer in the world at right. 10 years old. I know that's not a lot of, you know, having gone through puberty and whatnot, <laughs> but, you know, it takes a lot of dedication to to be good at something like that. And you know, other kids, you know, I was blessed with some great genetics as well. You know, other kids worked hard too, maybe not as hard as me, but didn't see the same results. And that's the man upstairs or your 
genetics from your parents that kind of help push you that extra, you know, 10%. It's like in basketball, the difference between a great player and a, and a average player can just be the smallest thing. Like there's a lot of people who are very talented, but they just don't have that last little bit to make them consistent and whatever, but they're as athletic as LeBron or, you know, tall, strong on paper, it looks amazing, but they don't have that last thing that, you know, sometimes can't be taught, you know? What do you think your last little thing was? I think, you know, growing up, I always was gifted athletically and I also worked really hard. But I think the last thing when you get to the NBA and there's people more athletic than you, more gifted, all those things, that last thing for me was just putting in the work and relentlessness, whether it was going to the offensive glass every time a shot went up, hoping to get, you know, four or five O boards in a game. But knowing that you probably got to go like 80% of the time to get whatever, or, you know, just that extra bit of effort, whether it's being in the best shape you can be in knowing that, hey, during a game like this guy might start off, but I'm just going to run the floor hard all game. He's just not going to be able to keep up with me. And, you know, those things matter and they all add up. You know, you look at some players like myself made a career out of it. You know, some other players like I... I've seen players who I'm like, God, this guy is amazingly athletic. He can do a ton of stuff, but he just could never play. Couldn't do it. Whatever reason, couldn't, game started going, couldn't pass it, make the extra pass, you know, couldn't see where he needed to be on the floor. But in a workout, amazing. Jaw dropping. It's it's one of those things where that's, that's, that's where the little last bit, that last couple percent really matters. Yeah, I love that. It's it's the work ethic. And then it's also for you. I mean, you have an amazing work ethic. I, I'm proud of my own work ethic. And we pushed each other when we were growing up, working out every off season together, sometimes six or eight hours a day. And through all that, you know, I feel like I worked harder than anyone I knew. You're the one guy who I do think worked a little harder than me. And I made it far, right? Division one, played professional basketball in Europe. You made it to the next step. And we're different people. We have different stories. A lot. There's a lot of factors at play. But I think when I think of you, I think of work ethic. Oh, thank you. I don't know. I can't sit here and be like, oh, I've just always been fueled to the point where I'm working out super hard all the time. And I'm just the model of perseverance and execution. You know, there's been times where I'm like, man, I think I should be playing. I'm not, I'm pissed a couple of days. Like I'm not, I'm not doing any extra work. I'm, you know, in a bad mood doing the minimal at practice, but then you always kind of get back to the, this is who I am. And this is what I need to do. Whether it's, whether I'm seeing results or not, I know this is how I'm supposed to work and prepare myself for the opportunity. You know, I was fortunate to get around people like former NBA player Chris Carr. We used to, we had a chance, me and you had a chance to play against an active NBA player while we were, uh, you know, high school, college age, you know, all the time. You know, that's, it's amazing to be able to get used to that and be brought down to, you know, the Target Center in Minnesota where the Wolves play and play pickup ball with the Timberwolves players during the summertime when we're in high school and stuff like that. And that's just, that's something that you can't, you can't, you know, there's no other way to get the benefits from that than actually doing it. In the NBA, they always say, coaches always say, you know, stay ready. If you go, if you talk to a coach and you're like, coach, man, I, I feel like I can help this team and I'm not playing. And the first thing they always say is stay ready, right? It's just like one of those things. And I always was like, okay, I'm never going to be a guy who gets an opportunity and isn't ready for it. You know, maybe you get an opportunity, you don't play great, but they're not going to say you weren't in shape. They're not going to say you haven't been putting in the work that you don't know the plays or whatnot. Like I'm going to have all those bases covered. So I make the most out of every opportunity. And I think it's that way with anything in life. You know, you got to be prepared for, you know, if I was living on no sort of budget and just living it up and just blowing all my money right now, I wouldn't be prepared to buy more real estate or get involved in this or get involved in that. You just always have to be prepared for what's next and put yourself in a position to have success. Right. And you have been incredibly adaptable. Several seasons ago, you wore three jerseys in a three-week period. Yeah. Yeah. Washington. Uh, what did I... So I got traded from Washington to Phoenix. 
bought out in Phoenix and went to Atlanta. So yeah, and that was all within about 10 days. Yeah. 10 days, not even three weeks, 10 days. So how do you, I mean, I think about translating that to some other context and, you know, you're, somebody works for a company and they get shipped to three different cities in a 10 day period and your life's turned upside down multiple times in a row. You know, it wasn't that difficult for me, but it is kind of funny to think about like, I'm, I'm here, I'm in Atlanta. I got, I remember I, I was taking a nap on a game day at about two in the afternoon and I wake up from my nap and I see, you know, the GM, assistant GM and my agent, you know, I got like about 14 missed calls and a bunch of, you know, before I even check the text messages, I'm like, oh man, it's during the time of year when a lot of trades happen. I was like, oh, I definitely got traded. Like why else would the uh, GM be calling me that much? And uh, then boom, you're gone and you don't go to that game that night. The next day you uh, pack up, you know, whatever you can uh, travel with and go to the new team and see what's going on and have, you know, someone that, you know, my assistant or someone working for me uh, pack up the condo and keep it moving. You know, it's just like that. How do you approach that level of uncertainty? Well, you approach it because you get to the new team and you start doing your, you know, your extra workouts, your different stuff that you've always done. It's just a different city different you know condo or whatnot you know you have to blend in with new teammates it's kind of it can be really difficult some players don't handle trades really well and they just it's it's a very very difficult thing but uh i'd been on a lot of teams so i was kind of used to ending a season and not knowing if i was going to go back to that same team yeah you have a really interesting balance of adaptability and rigidity because you can blend into all these different situations, right? This team to that team or one area of life to another. But you also have this rigid part of you where you're very grounded in, you know, getting back to kind of who you are and what makes you tick and the discipline and the work ethic. And it's, there's an interesting contrast there. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's all about the process in life of the road to success. You know, having achieved what I've achieved in the NBA or if you you know, financially or any of those things, I never really look at that and say, wow, I've made it, you know, for me, it's like, what's next? And, you know, I kind of grew up with those, you know, smaller goals to get to the bigger goal. So it's just always like focus on what you can do today to be better. You know, they always say successful people do what they want to do tomorrow today. Just just get it done. You know, uh, a coach told me once that, the worst mistake that a player can have is thinking that he's doing what it takes to be successful, but he's not. Like mentally going home at night, laying down and saying, I did everything I could do to be better today, but you really aren't because it's, it's, it's beyond basketball. It's a whole lack of understanding mentally of what's really taking place in, you know, in your sport or in life. Hmm. Is that a concern for you, a a fear for you that you're putting in work, it feels like the right work, but you might not be applying yourself in exactly the right way? You know, there's always a fear when you say, I just put in a a very large bid on a a 91 unit building. And there's always a fear like, are people going to think this is a good building to live in in a year? Like, is it going to be a good investment? You know, in basketball, it's kind of like you put in work, Hopefully everything works out. Sometimes you're not in control with it. So you're a very likable player on the court, kind of blue collar, rebound, right. hustle, do what it takes, be the glue guy. And then suddenly you're voted the most hated player in the NBA due to reality TV, not due to your play on the court. How are you able to have that much lightness given some of the negativity and drama going around? You know, I, I know what's gone into other areas of my life. So I hold that personally as my achievement and what I'm proud of. And uh, to me, it was kind of like, eh, you know, it's something that's there, but my identity kind of never changed. You know, that's kind of my approach is that, you know, everything in life is part of your journey, but, you know, people are a certain way in life and uh, you got to hold your own identity close to you and the people that really know you know who you are but you can't always control what everyone else you know thinks and the way they view you and if you're if you're chasing that you're probably going to lose your own identity in the process of trying to be a world pleaser 
or whatever the case is, you know, at the end of the day, I think if you can sit back with the people who are closest to you, your, just your mom, dad, cousins, best friends, whatever it may be, and be proud of who you are and what you've done in your life, I think that's what's important. Not, not to have, you know, whatever magazines say, hey, this guy's a good guy or whatnot, you know, because it's, you know, the world is fuel, fueled by controversy and drama. So you can never w really win that, uh, that race. Right. So you're really forming your own identity based on what you value and what you accomplish, even though the rest of the world or a bigger have, part of the rest of the world may have seen you in a different light. Right. No matter what you do in life, 50% of the people are going to love you. 50% of the people are going to hate you. And, you know, whether it's you're doing the right thing, you're doing some charity thing, someone might say, oh, you're only doing that for publicity. There was a period there where it really got tough and there was a, a, a bright, hot light on you and you were, you know, under a microscope. And, you know, one of the things that I admired about you during that time is how focused you were able to stay uh, at a time when it would have been very easy to become distracted. Well, I think with anything and any level of success in your life, in your sport, whatever makes you successful and whatever habits you've formed to be successful, you got to continue those things. So throughout my career, I was kind of known for always going to the gym at night, doing extra work, those kinds of things. And I think once you, if you think you've made it and you stop doing that, those kind of things, it's kind of like you've compromised what got you there and your growth is going to kind of cease. So for me, you know, even today, I still work out like a madman, even though I'm not playing right now. It's just, that's who I've always been. That's who I am. So you always kind of have to stay true to your identity. So when things got noisy around you, when things get tough around you, you center back around your discipline. Yeah, I, I think that because that's who you are. You know, as soon as you throw your discipline out the window, I think that you can kind of drift into other things. You know, most of the time when people make major changes or they stop doing the things that got them to be successful, they end up doing stuff. You know, you take the easy road, you you know, you're just not doing what you need to do to be successful. You know, I've played with some high level basketball players, you know, been teammates with from, you know, Dirk Nowitzki to, you know, Paul Pierce at the latter part of his career when I was in Washington. And this guy, Paul Pierce, like he'd come to the gym, he'd do the, you know, he'd do his workout every day before practice, his, his jump rope, his get his shots up, do his moves every single day and you think okay you're a hall of famer you've won a championship like do you really need to do that and that's just what he did after 13 years in the nba right now you're not currently playing on a team how have you approached fitness for yourself after that many years of being on the grind and now you're you're not playing what's your thought process around fitness well I look at fitness as it's been such an important part of my life. And I was thinking the other day about, okay, why do, you know, you hear about athletes not playing anymore. They're depressed. You know, they gain weight. Steve Nash said it best. It's almost like not playing your sport anymore is like, you know, going through a death in the family. And it can be that case for some people. It's just, it's a lot behind it. But my kind of approach is that I want to get that same feeling, you know, the endorphin release, the energy, the feeling good about yourself that I've had my whole life and continue that. So I'm doing, you know, I'm hitting spinning classes, which you and I did yesterday morning. I'm doing, you know, kind of like hit training. I'm lifting weights. I'm, I got a fat tire mountain bike that I ride on the lake outside my house. I'm doing a, a lot of different stuff and in, in, involved in other areas of fitness, but I'm trying to keep that kind of thing going where you get up in the morning, you work out hard, you feel good about yourself, you go about your day. I mean, I'm looking, you're really into health and fitness. And you know, I'm like, oh, how do you do it every day? I mean, you talk, you, you work out what six in the morning or something? Yep. Three days a week. I mean, that's, that's tough. I always look at someone that can do that in their life. And we talked about this yesterday, people that go and work out with you at six in the morning, they're what are they? They're typically successful people, right? Yeah, they definitely. I've had two workout partners and uh, they're both driven, successful people. Because you can't really get up at, and work out at six in the morning and have the discipline to do that, get your rest and do that, even if it's not 
on a professional level, you can't really do that unless you have the discipline, which will translate to other areas. And that's what's important about sports is, to me, taking that discipline and just applying it to other things. There were two things that struck me yesterday in doing that spinning class with you. <laughs> other than that, it was a damn hard work. Other than it was over 90 degrees in the class. <laughs> yeah. And I think I'm still rehydrating yeah. uh, 24 hours later. The two things that, that struck me, one, we drove 40 minutes from your house to go to this one specific spin class when presumably in Minneapolis, there are many other closer classes. Yeah, probably, we probably passed about 10 places we could so have that was spinning. the first thing that struck me and then the second thing that struck me is how you've created a community i was surprised to see how many people in the spin class you knew and you knew their names and well yeah i go down to the uh, minneapolis athletic club a lot of days and you know i just want to be competitive and around people who are working hard and excited about fitness so you drive 40 minutes because that's where you think the most competitive like kind of high caliber situation is? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's the best. And, you know, you have some ex-athletes in there, someone who I think is probably one of the top spin teachers that I've ever been to. And, you know, it's just, it's a whole community, you know, it's, it's, there's accountability. When I, you saw when I go in there and where have you been? You know, I was, I was out of town for 10 days and like, people are like, where you been, man? Like we're in this together, you know? And I love that. That's mm -hmm. amazing. That's just like, it's what you need. It's like having teammates, you know? Right. The other thing I noticed is that after the class, you stayed, you stuck around and you chatted it up with everyone. And, you know, you had that, <clears throat> that connection, those relationships. It was, it struck me that you were almost creating your own locker room dynamic that you may have had in the NBA where after you work hard, everyone's still sweaty, but you sit around and chop it up a little bit. Is yeah, that, just, is that just a reflex for you? Is that ingrained in you? <laughs> I've had some teammates who is it like Jason Capono? I played with him in Toronto. He won the NBA three point shootout one year, but I played with him in Toronto. And a lot of times like he's, he's in practice, he's out of there right away. He's gone. Right. It's just what he does. Like for me, I, I always, you know, stretch, cool down, relax, talk to some people, you know, it's, it kind of was and is my whole life. You know, that's, if I had to pick something working out is probably the most important thing that I do in my day to me. What, what does it mean to you working out? Why do you, why do you believe it's the most important thing in your day? I think that it's, it just keeps me balanced, you know, it keeps me, keeps my energy up, which, you know, a lot of people, maybe if you're not into fitness, you don't really understand how going to get tired can make you feel more energized, but you obviously understand that. It just, it's just something that I've done for so long since I was seven years old or whatever. I just, I, I need it in my life. If I, if I just retired and didn't do anything, any physical activity, I would go crazy. I was, I was talking over, uh, I was at a, like a new year's get together or a Chris, I, I think it was a Christmas party at my buddy's house. And there was this guy who played college football, try to make it to the pros and didn't, didn't make it, whatever. And he's like, I don't work out at all. I did. I worked out so hard. I'm over it. I don't hit the gym. I don't do nothing. And I'm just like, I couldn't understand how he's living his life like that. And maybe it works for him, but I don't get it. I was just like almost having a panic attack thinking about if I didn't work out at all, because it's like, it's so a part of my day. You know, you get up, you pack your gym bag, you know, you get try to get a cool looking outfit together and go hit the gym. You know, I don't have to wear a jersey right now of a team so I can get, you know, a little creative or whatever it is, but you know, it's it's kind of what I do. So I'm gonna take a left turn here with the conversation. So I heard, and I don't know if this is true or not, I heard you were banned from buying Range Rovers. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> is that uh, true? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. It sounds like there's a story there. That's an interesting point. I mean, I'm already banned, so I guess we can talk about it. But um, yeah, in 2012, when they came out with the new body style, they were going like hotcakes and people were exporting them to China or reselling them here. And it was just a really, you know, lucrative time to buy a car if you could get it at the MSRP price, which is like just the regular retail price and flip them. And for me, like, dude, I really need the money. I was, you know, I'm doing well, but I bought a, I got a Range Rover and I was like, 
well, man, I can make, you know, thirty-five, forty thousand dollars on this car. <laughs> Why would I kill? I'll sell it and buy another one. So I've heard of people flipping houses before. You were flipping Range Rovers. So you were buying them in the US and then where were you selling them? I would sell them to a guy who was the guy that would export them. But Range Rover, if you're listening to this, I was just selling them to a guy who just, I thought, really wanted the car, you know, <laughs> take me off the list. <laughs> so this is Range Rover arbitrage. So you're buying for one price in the U.S. and then some other guy is then selling them uh, for a higher price overseas. Yeah, and taking a cut. Yeah. Right. But you know what? It's like, can't everybody make money? I'm sure they were making a lot of money. Right. Rover was making money. So... So now, yeah, currently I do have a Rover. It's leased. My buddy leased it for me and I just <laughs> pay him for it. So, you know, we're working around it, you know? Yeah. And really though, what I think it exemplifies in you is that you're a very enterprising guy. You have a good head for business. I think I am uh, have been very impressed with you and you've got a nose for for business deals and you spot these opportunities and you're playing in a lot of different industries right now. It almost seems like the industry doesn't matter from real estate deals, this Range Rover thing, you know, cryptocurrency, five guys, burger joints. You have your hands in a lot of things while being an NBA player. So how did this interest in business come to be? Can you re remember where this started to blossom for you? Well, my dad growing up, he you know, he was able to be around a ton because he was uh, a stockbroker all his life. And then he quit and just started trading the market on his own and doing his own thing. So he's at home. You know, obviously he was busy during like trading hours. At a young age, I used to do his spreadsheets, his QuickBooks, whatever, and put all his trades and do all that kind of stuff for him. So you're doing, you're doing a financial accounting and helping place trades as a kid. Yeah, I was probably in, you know, seventh, eighth grade. I wasn't really placing trades back then. You know, everything's digital now. But back then you would do a trade, then you get like confirms in the mail, like confirmations of the trade. And then you, you know, take the confirm, make sure everything's right and put it in your own spreadsheet or QuickBooks. I don't know what he was using back then. And then you could kind of tell your, you know, your P&L profit loss and see where you're at for bookkeeping taxes, whatnot. So I was doing that for him. And that kind of opened my mind to numbers. And, you know, I was always pretty good at math. So my parents always made me work to get money. So, so you never had, you didn't have an allowance. They would give you a task and then pay you. For yeah, it. I had to work if I wanted like extra money to spend. So you're, you're doing all these financial transactions and learning the ropes from your dad around finance and applying your knack for numbers. Did it, it just built from there? Do you remember... Once you were, had been in the MBA and you had some capital to put to use, do you remember your first real bit creative business deal? I'm in what they had at this time uh, called the 20 and under program. So back then you didn't have to go to college at all. So people were, you know, 18 years old going to the MBA. And you were how old when you entered the MBA? 19. So I was in this program. They're kind of like, you know, I remember this lady, Krista Chin was running at the time. She works for the Players Association now. Uh, she used to be with the NBA, but they ask you kind of what you're interested in and all these different things. And my thing was out of the blue, I was just like real estate. I don't know. You hear a lot of successful people doing real estate. So she used to just send me a ton of books on real estate. I'd just read up. I didn't really necessarily know exactly what I was reading, but you know, you learn some things and then that kind of planted the real estate seed. And, um, throughout my career, not till really like 2000, probably nine or 10, did I actually like play a lot. So I got it in 04 and I kind of had this unstable career until 2009, 2010, where things really took off with the nets. So the whole time I'm thinking, okay, God, if I, if I can't play again, you know, if I can't do this for a long time or, you know, turn the corner and really start making a ton of money, which, you know, I mean, the NBA, I'm making a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. Right. Like, I don't want to be that, that guy who's, you know, millions of dollars, millions of dollars, but I wanted to do as well as I could for myself. So I started to look at different things in like probably 08, you know, we had the financial crisis and all that with the mortgage backed securities, you know, everything was tumbling down and I'm like, wow, what am I going to do with my money? Like, where am I going to put it? In those moments of fear and questioning, is this right? You're more motivated by the upside of it going well right. than the fear of what if. 
Yeah, you can't let fear dominate your life. And I think that growing up, my mom and dad were great at that. My dad quit his job and started doing his own thing. A lot of uncertainty with that, especially when you have two young kids. And that's kind of like my dad's mentality. The first thing I did when I I said, okay, I want to get involved in real estate. You know, I'm asking around, I asked my dad, who who's who's into real estate that you know? And there's there's this uh this guy, Ted Bigos in Minnesota, he's the largest individual owner of real estate in Minnesota. And my dad was like, Yeah, I, I you know, I, I know Ted. I I can get you his number. So I call him up and I'm just asking this guy question after question. And keep in mind, I don't really know what I'm talking about at this point. Like generally speaking, you know, a lot of people know a little bit. So I would just go around asking people questions. I, I remember some of the first properties I looked at, I was like, well, this is nice. Like I'm looking at all the numbers and it's just like, you know, kind of like Chinese to me. I'm like, uh, I don't really know what this means. Like how much am I going to make? You know, I didn't really understand depreciation on a building, you know, how debt service works, all these different things. So you kind of have to teach yourself along the way. And, you know, it's risky and it's, it's exciting though, when you look back and you say, okay, I'm, I'm doing really well. And I learned along the way and asked the right questions and had the right support. What are your real estate holdings now? And what do you look for in a real estate deal? You know, I've done some stuff in California, more single family stuff, flips and different stuff. But in Minnesota, I do a lot of multifamily real estate, anything starting from 17 units all the way up to 80 units. You know, I'm trying to keep growing and get bigger projects. How many apartment units do you have in your portfolio across all the buildings? I would say somewhere around 350 to 400 right now. Wow. In buying these apartment buildings, what red flags have you picked up on? Red flags? I would say, man, there can be a lot. If it's a building that just got built, a lot of times when when a developer builds a building, they just want to fill it up as quick as they can and then sell it, you know, get their money out of it. So for me, you have to look to see, do, do all the tenants have deposits on their apartments? And are they market rate deposits, what most people have tenants put down on, on units? You know, if they don't have deposits and it's, you know, first two months free and all these incentives, you may get a renter in there that's just like, hey, this is a great deal. I'm in here, but they're not like a good long term renter. A lot of times if if the building doesn't have high standards for looking at tenants credit credit rating and you know, what kind of tenant they've been in the past and they just want to fill it up. You know, you can inherit a building with some tenants that maybe won't treat it like it's their own place or don't plan on being there for a while and just are just in there because it's a great deal. You know, in real estate, you know, it's a lot of money at risk to make five to 10% on your cash, depending on your market. So it's, it's a totally different Thing. And there is a lot of fear that, hey, am I making a good decision? And hopefully this all works out because I'm committed to this. How do you deal with that, with that, that little voice saying, Chris, are you sure this is the right bid? This one could fall flat, buddy. You know, you take accountability for yourself and it's basically on you. You can't say, hey, the coach just wasn't feeling me. So I didn't play a lot, you know? So it's a, it's a totally different dynamic. And you know, this is your future. You work so hard to make this money and now you want to grow it. A lot of people might make money and just say, hey, I've made enough. Conservatively invest in some bonds and some blue chip stocks, get dividends and live out my life modestly, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, I'm always trying to find that competitiveness of growing something, getting better, trying to be the best at something. In this whole business world, there's a lot of Michael Jordans out there that you're trying to be like, and you get a good team around you. But ultimately, you know, I make the decisions on what I'm going to buy and moves that I'm going to make, whether it's different stuff I'm doing, day trading or the stock market or the five guys burger spots that I have. How did you get into the five guys burger business? During the, a tough time in the economy for the stock market, it, my parents were like, what about franchising? So we looked at, what did we look at? Burger King, Subway, Donald's, Fat Burger, like a bunch of different concepts. Some, some that didn't take off, some that are real strong. And five guys, we ended up buying the first store that they opened in Minnesota with a bunch of territory. It was kind of a shot in the, shot in the dark. I mean, the food's amazing, but it was poorly managed. 
when you look at the numbers that someone's showing you when you buy something, they're never the real numbers, you know, and then you get into the business and you're like, wow, we're actually, if we're doing well, we're breaking even right now. And if we're not, we're losing money. So, you know, I got to give all the credit for the operational side of it to my dad. You know, he stepped in, my dad and mom really, and they both stepped in and got the business running well. It was just one store. It's tough on just one store to really do well because you don't have that scalability that you do when you have multiple stores. So they got in there, got it profitable. We got our our next store open. And then from there, we really haven't uh, put any money into the business. It's just been all organic growth through profits. And it's been great, but it's it's very difficult. You hear a lot of nightmare stories about people going into business with family members, which you've done. What do you think uh, has contributed to that going well for you and your family where you're putting up capital and you know you're, you guys are jointly involved in in the running of those things how has that gone well for you or it's gone poorly for so many others well i think the biggest thing is you can't give someone responsibility that they can't handle and you have to be honest about that with you know whether it's your mom your dad your brother whoever it is you know you see a lot of athletes who a family member is running something for them but they really don't have experience and they really don't have maybe even the desire to do it to the best of their ability. It's just more something that they do because it's like, uh, I need to do something. You know, my dad having the business background, you know, they were in that store, my mom and dad, they were in that store working that business. And that takes a lot of like uh, humility to be able to go into like a burger spot and flip burgers and figure out what's going right, what's going wrong. How do we need to make changes? And the only real way to do that is to get your hands dirty. So they got in there and they really turned it around. Not that it was bad, but it wasn't doing what it was supposed to do financially. And then we got that thing pumping and doing well. And to your point, it's just, you gotta, sometimes it it doesn't work to do business with family members because it's hard to have tough conversations. But my parents, you know, working that business for me and being a lot of the day to day, they kind of push it so hard that I don't ever have to really worry about, hey, are you doing what you're, are you putting in the time? Are you doing this? Are you doing that? Like they're doing that. I don't need to worry about that. And they're smart enough and complex enough to do that. Right. It's not easy to have a lot of teammates will come up to me and say, oh, you're into five guys. That's awesome. Uh, I want to get one. How much is it? And I'm just like, well, you're so far from being able to do it and, and own it personally. Maybe you can have a buy into a group and they can run it for you or whatnot. And, you know, one of those deals through your financial advisor, invest in a group, but just to do one, like it's just, it's so complex and so difficult and you need to do more than one to really get the benefits of, you know, having managers that manage multiple stores or your insurances will come down the more stores you have, food costs, you know, labor, being able to have employees go from one store to another and different things like that. So it's just so complex that you're like, "Uh, how do I answer this question? Uh, You should really look into it. And something great the NBA is doing is they do like a summer franchising program. Uh, There's a guy, Junior Bridgman, owns hundreds of Wendy's, played in the NBA, old school guy, the best, one of the top five franchisees in the United States for any brand. So... I I haven't been to it, but I know that they do a great job with that program they do. And you got to dig in and and like it. If you don't like it, you're not going to do the work and the research and all that that it takes to be successful. You know, just there's a lot of stuff and it's it's not an easy deal. If you want to open up a five guys, like it's just, it's not that easy. If you want to do, you know, anything, you got to really understand it. One of the commonalities I'm getting from the way that you've described your approach to real estate investing and to franchising with owning five guys is your willingness to get into the details and to really get in there. And you, you seem to have a drive to want to really understand the mechanics and the inner workings. And, you know, Warren Buffett always says he only invests in things that he understands. Right. It might sound sexy, but if he doesn't get it, he's not going to invest. 
for you, what is it about that willingness? I think there's a curiosity there right. is, is at the bottom of that. Like, what is your curiosity with business and how these things work? Well, I've always said that, you know, if you gave me a book about something I'm not interested in, you probably couldn't pay me enough to read it. Like, I just, <laughs> I, <Yeah. laughs> I can't do it. You know, it's just like, I'm going crazy. But if it's something I'm really interested in, I can spend all day doing it. So when you look at whether it's five guys and you're going to lease a space and build out a store, you know, the numbers for that, knowing if that works, a lot of it's, it's the same as, you know, buying an apartment building or different things. You have to figure out how much rent can we pay knowing that, you know, common area maintenance known as CAM is going to be this much. Our normal store grosses this much. Our labor, we're going to have to pay this much per hour typically or doing all those numbers. You have to figure that out before you can get involved in something because then you sign a lease for 10 years with two five-year options on it. And if the store's not working, you just spent all this money to build it out, put the ovens or, I mean, the stovetops, the this, the that, milkshakes, get it looking cool on the inside, all those different things. It's really expensive and then it's not going to work. So it's, you have to really be able to know what you're doing and look at those numbers. And it's kind of like if someone said, you know, you, if you run a company like a, your company, you could go and run a different company. A lot of the stuff, it's the same, whether, so for us, whether we're selling burgers or we're doing retail, have a store at the mall, like it's all the same stuff. It's just what you're selling is different. You know, there may be some things that are a little bit different depending on what area you're involved in, what category you're you're doing, but it's all the same pro same thought process. So you have to get that down first. And I think, you know, reading those books when I was 19 years old and asking questions and doing different things kind of set the table for when I'm really learning, okay, what's what is this really? I already have a little bit of a background to be able to expand on versus going in cold and having no idea and having to, you know, sometimes even in the early stages, like I'm sitting there researching, I'm, I'm looking at properties and I got my phone. I'm like, Oh, what is this? He's talking about I'm Googling things. Like, you know, you just don't know sometimes you right. have to ask questions and find out, you know? Right. And so that's a, this is the theme of adaptability and rigidity coming back. You have this like rigidity with needing to understand the numbers right. and the mechanics and the inner workings of the business, but you're willing to be adaptable and extend that dynamic out into a bunch of different industries. So I kind of see that theme again, um, playing out in that way where I'd first thought about you as an athlete with that skill set, And now really for the first time, I'm seeing it showing up in your life in business. It's funny when you look at business and sports, there's no better business than being an athlete, the money spent or time spent to the return is insane. So you, you get in another business and you're like, wow, these guys are, you're pumping this much money in, or say you have a store that grosses, does 2 million in sales. Like the average person is like, oh, wow, you did 2 million in sales. Like, what is that? Like you made like one and a half million dollars on that store. And you're like, not really. You're looking at a net return of 12 to 15 percent or whatever it is. In most industries, it's lower. So you really have to run a really good business to be able to do well and be successful. And certain things, certain mistakes, or if you're mismanaging your labor, different stuff like that can really put you from profitable to not profitable. Right. And part of that, you know, talked about the curiosity that you have and your willingness to get your hands dirty and your, you know, hunger to understand the details. And I'd like to get more into surrounding yourself with people who are better than you. You, know, you mentioned when we used to go play uh, against the Timberwolves when I was in college and right. you're in high school and we're playing against Kevin Garnett, the MVP of the NBA. In his prime the number one basketball player on the planet we're playing against him. And there's an unbelievable amount of lessons packed into every time you step in the court with the world's best. And I've seen how you've taken that dynamic and applied it into other areas of your life. It's like for me being able to be around people who are really successful and they just, they can just asking them about their different things. You know, the other day I was in the health club, I run into the the guy who I talked to when I was, 
you know, first getting into real estate, sitting in the hot tub, he rolls in, he's asking me questions about five guys. I'm like, God, I really, I don't want to talk about that. Let me ask you stuff about your, <laughs> about what you're doing. And it's just a really cool dynamic. And, uh, the interesting thing about this guy, uh, Ted Vigos, who's huge into real estate is he's, he's asking me questions about five guys and just continuing on. And I'm like, I want to ask you, you're the most successful guy I know in real estate, especially, you know, who's doing it on their own. I want to ask you a ton of questions. What a moment. So your first real, it sounds like business mentor is now asking you questions about business. What's that like for you? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I mean, I almost, you don't feel worthy. Actually, you're sitting there like, uh, like this is, you know, we have a, we have a bunch of stores where, you know, like I'm not on your level, dude. Like, why, why are you asking me? Like, you almost feel like, oh, why do you want to, you know, is that worth your time? And actually I asked somebody about him. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm was sitting there and I'm trying to learn more from him. And he's, he's asking me all these questions. And they're like, yeah, he's a great listener. And when I hang out with him, he ends up asking me about my stuff and listening more than, you know, him talking about his own thing. And it's amazing that someone that can be so successful with, I think, you know, 8,000 units can be, you know, humble and listen to people. And that's probably a testament to him being so su successful is that, you know, sometimes when you're talking, you don't, you miss an opportunity to hear something you need to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it sounds like a, another trait that you share with him is the curiosity piece. You're curious when, when people bring up one of the things that I've noticed about you is when you're around someone who's been successful at something, you're very curious. You ask a lot of questions and whether you think you're going to get into that necessarily or not, you're curious to know what goes into I want to know how the business works. Yeah, that's just my thing. And I always had to tell myself, okay, don't get too specific. I don't want to be offensive when I'm talking about the intricacies of their business. Like I'm trying to figure out how much someone makes or whatnot. I just want to know kind of how you become successful in that business and what's important as far as, you know, operations or whatever you're doing to scale a business or even just start one and be, you know, successful at it. So Hopkins High School, national powerhouse, where we both had the opportunity to play for a uh, amazing coach. So legendary, legendary coach. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Ken Novak Jr., you know, ESPN national coach of the year. He would always say, hey, choose your friends carefully. If your friends are guys who go ride the escalator at the mall, uh, you know, that's probably what you're going to end up doing. If your friends are studying and getting good grades, that's probably what you're going to end up doing. He said association breeds assimilation. Correct. Unbelievably well put. I really took that to heart. You have as well. And how did you use that dynamic to approach cryptocurrency? You know, I, I've had friends that you know, as it was getting going and I'm hearing more about it during research, I'm a part of a, uh, a little crew. We call ourselves the uh, crypto maniacs. <laughs> Wait, tell me about this crew. What do you mean you're involved in a little crew? Uh, well, we're on a, uh, a group chat and I know most of the guys from growing up in Minnesota. Some of them are anywhere from wealth managers to uh, one of the guys works at Credit Suisse and researches oil companies and other guys that a, um, a consultant on global markets. You sought out Else counsel works. from um, the Winklevoss twins from Facebook. Yeah, you uh, know the what, social actually, network fame. Oh my God, those guys were talking about cryptocurrency back in 2011, 12. I remember I was on a cruise, uh, kind of a conference on a cruise called Summit at Sea, and um, the Winklevoss twins were on that. And I remember them talking about cryptocurrency way back then. And I was like, oh, I don't know, it sounds kind of crazy, kind of risky, but you heard the same things and you got really curious about it and you dug in deep and you've now, you know, taken action in it. So you've got the, is it the crypto maniacs? Yeah, said? I, I would so. say that, I would say that, uh, you know, I did hear about it early on at a Rangers hockey game with the Winklevoss twins. One of my buddies introduced us. We watched a game and they were talking about it a little bit, but I really got into it when my childhood neighbor and one of my best friends was talking to me about it, you know, just kind of dove in. And, you know, luckily I dove in at a time when, you know, I was able to, who knows what a good price or not a good price is on this stuff right now. Cause we've kind of been up and down and down right now. But, uh, you know, I was able to learn at a time where, you know, able to make some money and, 
you know, build a, a nice little portfolio. And right now we're all weathering the storm, but uh, it's it's been fun. And there's a lot of junk coins out there, a lot of a lot of trash, but there's a lot of things that have great technology behind them, are very useful. And like we were talking about the other day, blockchain technology is here to stay, whether it's for, you know, cities and or municipalities or for banking or using blockchain with uh, smart contracts and different stuff like that. I'll have, to, I'll have to learn the rubs from you. You'll be one of the experts I surround myself with. <laughs> yeah, now. I'm by no means an expert. I know a lot more than the average person, but uh, I don't even know if there is an expert right now. It's so new. And, you know, I think the closest thing to it would be the people involved in it early on, like the Winklevosses would probably be the closest thing to a actual expert in the space. But, uh, you know, I'm always learning, reading and it's a totally different kind of market that mm -hmm. drives off of a lot of, uh, as they call it, FUD, fear, uncertainty, and distrust. And fake news, true news, whatever you want to have it affects the market drastically. You know, a lot of that affects the stock market, but not to the same degree that uh, the cryptocurrency market is affected. Right. And in that uncertainty, so you really, you seek out people who are as curious, invested, perhaps more more successful than you are. Uh, does that help you through the uncertainty to surround yourself with 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 people who are experts and who you look up to or what do you get from surrounding yourself with these kind of people well definitely i don't ever personally want to be the smartest person in the room or think i'm the smartest person in the room because i think that at that point then you're surrounding yourself with the wrong people or you're living in a fantasy world you know one of the two things you need to check yourself so you know, looking at the guys that I'm involved with daily in cryptocurrency, they're just, I feel like they're all smarter than me, especially in that space. So I'm always learning, but you know, I really believe long-term in the technology. So I've kind of uh, been in there, weathered the storm, but still in a good position. So you're doing all this while being an active NBA player. What, was there a perception from the NBA, from teammates, coaches, a franchise that you're playing for, what do they make of all this? Well, you know, you a lot of times in the NBA, you have your teammates and you love your teammates. Everyone's different. It's, you know, you have 15 people in a locker room in basketball and everyone's into different things. One guy might be, you know, doing some music on the side. One guy might be doing whatever. And a lot of times you might find like maybe two guys per team that kind of are on your same wavelength. And I had a a teammate who you know, Drew Gooden, who's, Really, I think he has a wing stop or something. He has a bunch of, uh, he's into retail, real estate, like strip malls and different stuff like that. We became really good friends. We always knew each other because I went and visited Kansas when he was playing there. And, uh, you know, didn't really become really good friends until we were on the same team. But, you know, he had that business mind where every day we're like, looking at the stock market, we're talking about, we're looking on LoopNet and different sites about, you know, looking at retail space and multifamily real estate and just trying to figure out kind of, okay, what, what's next in life after basketball? And he was, he was influential because he was in Milwaukee playing for the Bucks for a while and he got waved, stretched, waved or whatever. So he was out of the NBA for a little bit and then he ended up getting back in. But you know, he would always say like, I've, I've seen what it's like not to be playing ball. Like that's, what's getting me into all this other stuff. Cause I, you know, I want to use that same energy and competitiveness for other things. So, you know, it's, it's always interesting. You know, I talk to him all the time. I was just with him last week and, you know, he's talking about the different things he's involved in. I'm pulling up a listing of the property that I put an offer on. I'm showing him getting his opinion and it's cool to have that camaraderie, but you don't see it all the way across the board. Cause in the NBA, you have people from, you know, age 19 to in their thirties and people are so different that, uh, you know, from the average person, they're all interested in five guys and franchising and stuff like that, which is, which is great. And it's a great place to start. You gotta be interested in it to start in it, but you know, it takes a lot, so which makes me, you know, thankful that the NBA does a lot of stuff to promote uh, self-development outside of basketball. Absolutely. You know, you gotta bet on yourself. Like I know, I know you, uh, you do your thing at color jar. So that's, uh, it's not easy. I've always said, I've always said about you, I'm like, God, you, you know, you have X number of employees. How do you manage all that? Like, these are like, you know, that's a, that's tough. You know, we have a lot of 
part-time employees, mainly, you know, assistant managers and, and general managers are full-time employees. It's a lot, you know, it's a, it's tough to do. Yeah. It's a lot of responsibility and it seems like you're really stepping into that really well. How did you, so we've talked indirectly about Minnesota. It's kind of colored most of the comments and stories thus far, but we haven't talked about Minnesota directly. And you know, you choose to make Minnesota your home in the off season. And what is it about Minnesota? You know, I, I love Minnesota in the winter when it's, when it's really cold, snowy, you can uh, snowmobile, do different things like that, ice fish. But then, the, then you get to the summer and anyone who's been to Minnesota, even if you've just like flown over Minnesota, you fly in and you just see all this green trees and lakes and it's just the most beautiful thing. And, you know, I've grown up on lakes from when I'd go up to my grandfather's lake in the summertime to my parents moving on a lake when I was in about ninth grade. And then, you know, my first home being on a lake in Minnesota. So it's just kind of the lake life. I love to, I love to get out there, do some wake surfing, uh, you know, got some jet skis, different fun activities. As you know, you've been out there. Absolutely. Did you wake surf last time you were there? I haven't, I haven't yet. Uh, we got to get up there. You know, I see the photos of you, you know, six foot nine, 245 up there on a wakeboard. Maybe a little more like 250. Right now, <laughs> the, how did you get into uh, wake surfing? Wake and, surfing. So there's a difference. And yeah, what's the difference? Obviously, I'm out of my depth here. Well, so wakeboarding is like your feet are strapped in. It's a longer rope. You, you you go behind these boats that cast these big waves. So you're on a lake behind a power boat. Right. And you're surfing on the wake that's created by the boat. So it's almost like this wave that's continuous that's coming from the engine. Right. And with technology now and the way they weight the boats down, these uh, surf boats cast like a, a pretty big wave that's probably, you know, three feet high, maybe two and a half, three feet high. And just surf it you know you can do whatever whatever you would do on the ocean in terms of you know tricks if you're on a skim board there's a lot of stuff you can do you know i'm a little more basic and beginner level although i it, it may look like i'm pretty good but if you look at the people who are really good it's amazing those guys usually weigh like 150 60 pounds so it's a lot easier to stay in the wave and have you know that propulsion because you're lightweight you know Right. So the so it's the it's the Minnesota summers and the lake life and all those activities that really keeps you because you could live anywhere in the world. Right, right. And you know, you you choose to come here, you choose to come back. What about the people? When you think about Minnesota people, what do you think about? Well, you always hear like Minnesota nice. I think that the people here have been great supportive of, uh, around my career even, you know, you you might go in the grocery store and some guy will be like, "Hey, uh, I used to watch you at Hopkins or you know, whatever. There's a big community around supporting, you know, high school sports in Minnesota. I remember just, you know, the Rosen Sports Sunday shows and the, you know, a lot of people talk about Texas football. Like you get that sense with like Minnesota basketball, maybe not on that level, but it's still that kind of community. If you could um, design your ideal day, what does that look like for you? So like absolutely script your perfect day. Walk me through what happens. Uh, what time do you wake up and then what happens next? If it was the summertime, I would try to start my day a lot earlier. You know, get up like my whole my whole career as a basketball player. Summertime training, I'm up at like six o'clock. I'm a big coffee guy, as you know. We made a uh, caribou run this morning. Big coffee guy and uh, get a coffee get to the gym. I usually don't eat much before I go to work out. I'm in the gym by 7, 7.30 and I'm done with everything by one or two o'clock so I can go hit the lake. That's like my day. Get up early so I can hit the lake and be out there. I love it. Even, uh, even on designing your perfect day ever is filled with work ethic and hustle. Well, cause to me it's, it's fun. Like what, are, what are you going to do? Go shopping. You're going to like, what's, what's really fun. I think trying to grow something is fun. Whether it be grow yourself or grow a business or that challenge. Yeah, I mean, I got to imagine that you could work for a lot of different companies and I'm sure you get offers all the time, but one, you want to be your own boss, I'm assuming, and it's fun to grow something and, and see it grow. Like I, I, I don't know any other reason why you would not just go 
work for a huge company and work your way up unless you had that mindset. Yeah. When I think of your work ethic, I actually think about uh, the vacation we took in the Bahamas um, a number of years ago, and you were coming off of um, your two best career seasons with the Nets, where you averaged a double-double two years in a row. And um, we're, we're in the Bahamas, at Atlantis, and my phone rings in the room, and I pick it up, and it's usually like, hey, man, did you hear what happened? And I was like, no, I didn't hear what happened. You know, like, come down, meet me in the lobby. So I meet you in the lobby, and I'm like, dude, dude, what's going on? What happened? And you're like, I just signed with the Nets. You know, this was your your two year, twenty four million dollar deal, and I was floored. I was like, dude, this is amazing. You're set. You know, God, that's got to feel so good to have almost that monkey off your back of signing your big deal. And you looked at me like I was crazy, and I'll never forget what you said to me. You said, "No, now people are going to think that I'm." overpaid. I need to work harder than I ever have before so I can play better so that people think that I'm underpaid. And even though we're in Atlantis, we go and the first thing we do after that was to hit the gym and we got a workout in before going to the beach. I I remember that workout. I don't necessarily remember the conversation, but I remember going into the gym and just, that was a very tough workout. I think it was like some crazy amount of pull-ups and different stuff that we were doing. And I think it's really emblematic of your mindset of you had this moment where, you know, the you kind of cleared a new bar, right? You signed your first big MBA contract. And a lot of people, that's a that's a take the foot off the gas moment, right? Where it's like, okay, wow, whew, I did it. And don't get me wrong, we celebrated plenty that night, but your first instinct in that moment was to go to the gym and work out so hard that you still remember this workout years later. Any final thoughts you have or things that you want to share or perhaps thinking about, you know, other pro athletes who are thinking about how they navigate, you know, their transition or how do they develop themselves for life beyond sports? Any, any wisdom that you have or things you want to share? Well, when you first talked to me about this podcast, I was thinking like, you know, your whole thing is, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, the, the transition from athlete to business. And I was like, well, I didn't really stop playing to become a businessman or get involved. I think that you have to, there has to be that curiosity early on. You got to get involved early because when you're playing sports and you're visible in the NBA, you can almost call any company, any CEO, get a lunch, talk to them, ask questions. When you're out of the league, you're not as visible or, you know, they always say when you're done playing basketball, no one will care. It'll be hard to get a meeting. It'll be hard, whatever. So they've always said in NBA players who've talked to different teams I've been on, have always said, start early, like whatever you want to get involved in, do it now when people will take your call and you can bring, you know, the CEO of whatever company to game, or you can bring someone and build a relationship around your sport and bring their kids. Their kids are excited. It's, it's it's a fun thing and it's a good conduit to other things. You know, I focused on that and then I was like, oh, it's podcast about after, but I've, I've really been doing it for a while and I've had some great people around me. Like my parents, I couldn't do the five guys thing if I didn't have my parents. Like they're just been amazing, really smart, hardworking people. You know, I have to thank them for that. So, but it's, it's also hard to get great people around you that can do great work for you and that you trust, you know? So it's, there's no answer in life to any of that. It's just feeling it out and using your judgment and putting yourself in a uh, position to succeed. Great. Well, thanks for being such a shining example of an athlete who is much more than only an athlete and um, for sharing so much about your approach to finding success beyond sports. This has been an awesome conversation and I appreciate you being so uh, open and and sharing so much knowledge with me and, and with everyone else. Yeah, it's, it's been great. Thanks for uh, making me a part of this. If people want to reach out to you on, say, Instagram, uh, where can they find you? Just Chris Humphreys, at Chris Humphreys, or Twitter, Chris Humphreys. Thank you. Well, you're a gift, brother, and um, keep doing what you're doing. It's fantastic. There are comprehensive show notes and links to everything and everyone mentioned in this episode at thebigjumpshow.com. If you're listening while driving or perhaps juggling fire, don't worry because everything and everyone discussed is all for you on the website with comprehensive show notes. 
Just go to thebigjumpshow.com and we've got you covered. Along those lines, I want this podcast to become its best. And I learned from sports that feedback is love and improves performance. So give me some feedback. I want to create better content for you. So tell me what you liked. Tell me what could be better. The Big Jump is on Instagram and Twitter, both at Big Jump Show. And leave a quick review on Apple Podcasts because it helps get the word out about the mission to inspire someone's next big jump. And remember to subscribe if you like what you hear and might want more. There's a lot more in store for season one of The Big Jump and beyond. I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Grand Voyage, a luxury fashion brand and a personal favorite of mine that makes shoes and bags designed in LA and handcrafted in Italy. GQ says they're, quote, changing the fashion game. And I always say, if you're changing up your game, you better look the part. So use promo code THEBIGJUMP for $35 off the beautiful bags and shoes from Grand Voyage. By the way, my favorite item has got to be the blue burnished leather high tops, which are handcrafted in Tuscany, Italy. So go check them out. See what I mean? Yes, blue leather high tops. Go to thebigjumpshow.com slash shoes. And from there, as they say, the rest is up to you. This is The Big Jump, a podcast about human reinvention, featuring pro athletes who have leveraged their athletic minds for success beyond sports.